So um, I have the pleasure of introducing James Caval, who's uh, going to be moderating today's panel on the federal and state role. Uh, James is the founder of the College Movement, a nonprofit that advocates for policies that help students graduate from college and find jobs. And this work will carry forward in his new role uh, with the Institute for College Access and Success, or TICUS. Uh, previously, James served as President Obama's Deputy Domestic Policy Advisor, uh, where he worked on higher education and other domestic policy issues, and was a driving force but behind some of President Obama's higher ed policy achievements. Uh, previously to that, he held positions on uh, President Obama's reelection campaign in the U.S. Department of Education, the House of Representatives, the, Sen the Senate, the Clinton White House. He has a distinguished uh, career and has been an important uh, uh, force in these discussions for many years. So we're thrilled to have you here t today, James, and I'll turn the mic over to you. <laughs> uh, thanks, everyone, uh, for coming here to Austin. Thanks. Harrison, for all the work you've done to host us, this event has been terrific, and for the kind introduction. Uh, I'm honored to be here with this uh, incredible group of higher education thought leaders uh, here on the panel, but also in the room. Uh, with me, we have, uh, to my uh, immediate right, uh, Nancy Zimfer. Nancy was the past chancellor of the State University of New York, which of course is uh, the largest comprehensive public system in the country, serving uh, some 450,000 students. Uh, she is well known for her commitment to student success at scale, and among education wonks for her earlier work in her time when she was president of the University of Cincinnati on Strive Together, which is a really innovative model to bring communities together around data and around uh, better student outcomes. Uh, to Nancy's right is Ted Mitchell. Ted is the new president of the American uh, Council on Education and is the authoritative voice of American <laughs> higher education. Uh, he previously was uh, undersecretary of education in the Obama administration where he um, oversaw uh, higher education policy. He was president of Occidental College, president of the California State Board of Higher Education, uh, president of New Schools Venture Fund, so has a long list of uh, relevant and interesting perspectives on higher education. Uh, Zakia Smith is the strategy director uh, at the Lumina Foundation where she oversees um, an overall effort to try and drive higher completion rates uh, and better value out of uh, American higher education. She previously served as a special assistant to President Obama for higher education where she helped design um, many of the president's critical higher education initiatives. And then on my far right is uh, Mike Krauss. Mike is the uh, executive director of the Tennessee Higher Education Commission, where he's been involved in uh, many of the policies that Governor Haslam has put in place, the Drive to 55, the Tennessee Promise, uh, Tennessee Reconnect, uh, and overall, you know, I think what many consider to be uh, the most innovative and interesting set of state level policies around uh, driving higher com higher education completion. So I think this is a, a, a fantastic group. And uh, what I hope we can take uh, and do in this hour is unpack a little bit uh, Michael Crow's observation that our system is designed for the outcomes uh, that we have and think about what are the foundations and the impact that uh, federal and state policy have on the outcomes we get out of higher education systems. and what should policymakers be doing differently if they want to embrace uh, the imperative created by uh, the research of Raj and John and Dave, and how do we think differently about um, uh, the priorities in terms of data, how we fund colleges, how we support students. Uh, I want to start, though, with a little bit of a more foundational question with Ted, and that's about um, the value of higher education. and. Um, there was a discussion on the earlier panel about some doubts. We now know that most Republicans think that higher education has a negative impact on American society. And, and you know, we obviously are all here uh, in part because of the research. We all believe deeply in the value of higher education and spend our careers on it. Um, you know, is there a point uh, that people have? And 
what do we need to do to respond to this increasing public skepticism? Yep, and uh, we, I think Stephanie recognized it early on and it, it uh, has come up in uh, each of the panels. And to just kind of, I think, summarize that and move, uh, move it forward a little bit. And I think we, we're at a point of pretty enormous paradox where higher education has never been more important. It's never been more important to individual success, to the success of communities and uh, our economy and our democracy. And I think we're here because, James, as you said, we believe that. But on the other side, higher education has rarely been under this kind of, of fire, uh, from, certainly from people on the right side of the, of the political, political spectrum, but across the board. We've done some uh, surveys uh, at ACE trying to understand this problem. And the erosion of public confidence is real, and that erosion of the public endowment uh, that was so nicely uh, uh, displayed on the wall last night uh, is, is actually quite real. And in the conversations that we've had uh, across the field and uh, again through our pollsters, there are two flavors of it. One is a flavor that says, the world just doesn't understand the really good work we do. And so we have to talk about it. We have to tell better stories of the achievements uh, that we have. And we have to do it, what, louder, faster? I don't know. Um, that's one. Uh, the second is uh, we have a lot to answer for. And uh, these erosions in the poll numbers really are a wake-up call for us. I think both are true. I think that the institutions that you represent and that we work with uh, are doing marvelous, magnificent uh, things for individuals and families every day. And we do need to be better about talking about that. But I think that the research shows that there's a long way to go. Uh, and we've talked about a number of the, the pressure points. Uh, the friction and frustration of transfer. Uh, the, uh, you like called it the killing field of college algebra and remediation in general. These are things that create a, a set, as John said, of lived experiences for students and their families uh, that make it hard to support either the specific enterprise in a local college or the general enterprise of higher ed. I would add to that that the escalating cost and price of higher education, particularly as tuition falls more on the shoulders of families as states continue to disinvest, that the, the rising cost and price of higher education has changed the way think, people think about the value equation. And it's made them much more suspicious. When you're getting something for nothing, sometimes your quality bar is not as high as when you're having to pay for it or go in, into debt. And I think that that's something that we really need to talk about and add to our uh, discussion today is um, about the cost and the, and the price of higher education. So I think these things, James, are real. I think that we can address them both by changing the way we do things and changing the way we talk about them, but we have to do both in concert. So Nancy, you have been working at Upper Mobility and Higher Education since before it was cool. And uh, I wonder um, if you could talk a little bit about your experience leading not a campus, but a system. And uh, you know, higher collaboration among universities is also trendy. That is, of course, the role of the system. So what does it make sense for um, colleges to try and do together? And what does it make sense to try and uh, decentralize and help give colleges freedom to uh, innovate? Well, first of all, um, I'm thrilled to be here. And uh, you're catching me in the midst of massive withdrawal. I've lost my bully pulpit, and I'm in desperate search for uh -huh. one. So I just, this could be yeah. it. It could be really, really exciting for us. But when I began at SUNY eight years ago, we were living in the throes of dissolution, which is a word I was unfamiliar with, but essentially dissolving the system. It was an initiative under the Pataki administration, and it was really to keep us separate, independent, and reduce the power of central administration. So um, it didn't happen as a uh, strategic, thoughtful, gee, I know what I'm going to do when I get to SUNY. What happened is, um, the usual question is, what are you going to do when you get here? What's your first move? And I mistakenly said, I'm going to visit the campuses, which at the University of Cincinnati took a golf cart in two days. You know, <laughs> I mean, I, 95 days later, I came home, which means I never even went in my office and sat down, which I would have inherited all the nasty problems if I had done that. But I, this wasn't intentional. But what I came back with is, oh my god, these 64 campuses 
uh, in partnership with our good friends at CUNY. They are the economic answer to what's ailing New York and this country because that was 2009. And I was so busy being a president, I didn't even know we were having a recession. It was that bad. <laughs> I bought a house when I went, went to Albany, you know, ridiculous. But it paved the way for being able to think universally in a system oh, we have a common problem. It is that we can be, but we aren't the kind of economic engine that we need to be. Add to that, I have my own personal theory of leadership, which starts with vision. I really do believe that when you walk onto a campus, you really have to hear people talking about the vision. Even if they're making fun of it, at least they know we have one. And you know how faculty can trivialize the vision into something silly. But to me, that was always a good sign. At least they knew we had one. And we also created that vision, uh, I say, at the hands of many. Someone said to me the other day, pay now or pay later. If you skip process, it will come back to haunt you because it won't get implemented or it will be undermined, et cetera, et cetera. So, I put the faculty leadership, I'm talking about the faculty senate of a large public university system on my cabinet. The students run the cabinet. The student is a voting member of the board of trustees, the student leader of these 64. So process begat a central theme. I used to say vision trumps everything, but I have to, like vision excels over everything. I have to, you know, that trumps it doesn't. Catchphrase. I'm just waiting for you to catch up here. Um, <laughs> Anyway, the, looking back, the things I'm proudest of is that we created a way to make policy through our Board of Trustees that began with problem solving on the ground. As a consequence, we now have an accountability system where every campus is held public, uh, held to a public transparency on their progress. We do have a process of seamless transfer. I've not had enough time to, to say to JB that now that the SUNY transfer system, which is 50 pathways toward 95% of the major students seek, does transfer without exception, only with appeal, so that an individual transfer problem gets solved, because by the way, that's the way our legislature decides whether we're good or not. One student calls and says, I couldn't transfer, the game is over. CUNY has a transfer system. The biggest thing on the planet we could do is you heard it here, JB. Uh, put the CUNY and the SUNY transfer system together. Oh my God, a lot of students go upstate. A lot of upstate students go to New York City, as you would understand. Um, we were able to launch a massive uh, online system, now 564 online degrees and nearly 200,000 students um, participating in our online programs. That helps completion a lot. Um, we now have a policy from the board uh, that every student will be provided an applied learning opportunity. That's 465,000 students choosing from a workplace or a research or a civic engagement that ultimately will be on their transcript. Already 15 of the 64 campuses have, have that. Uh, we're now 20 campuses doing Mathway, uh, uh, Quantway rather, and Statway uh, to uh, ease the transitions into college level math. So that is as good as I can do on the statistics because um, after you walk out of the chancellorship, you forget all the data that you've said <laughs> a thousand times over. But what we really did to add to the conversation is to add a word to our vocabulary, mimicking Stephen Colbert, who apparently, I'm never up that late, uh, created the word truthiness. Mm -hmm. Does anybody know that? I mean, right. Thank you, Zakaya. Um, so the brilliant teenagers who work as interns in my office said, you know what? We can take this, the sum is, uh, the parts, how am I going to say that? The sum is uh, better than the total of the parts. I didn't say that right. I've said it a thousand times. But we created the word systemness, which means that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, and that if we were going to survive and contribute to New York and to this country, we're going to have to act like a system. So what worries me, just in closing on this intro, is uh, our ability to achieve systems change. Systemness as a national imperative at the federal government, at the state level, and at the local level. And here we are, once again, 
talking to ourselves. So what I'd like to take as lessons learned by behaving as a system at SUNY and lessons learned from my Strive Together experiences, which is a cradle to career view of how to educate more people, David Leonhardt, and educate them better. What do we have to do to break down the systems that have created the silos that make it impossible for us to effectively use the data? And so I pretty much believe that data are everything. I think it's plural in my world. And that the only way we're going to effectively use the data we are discussing today is if we can do it through system change. And I'd have to say, I learned a hell of a lot about that, leading a system that was totally just a set of institutions that flirted with each other, not a group where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. So I can come back and unpack. Uh. Zakia, I want to talk to you a little bit. Obviously, Lumina is very associated with the big goal uh, of 60% uh, college graduates by 2025. Uh, I wondered uh, how you thought about that goal relating to um, the upward mobility research. Uh, are they synonymous or are they somewhat different? And what do you think are the big moving pieces that we need to do to get to the, the Lumina goal? Sure. I think when you initially asked me this, you, you were more, um, you were less diplomatic and you said that the data, and I'm looking at Michael Nettles here, like, yeah. the data show that you're not going to reach the goal and what are you going to do about that? And so I appreciate you trying to like clean it up, but we can um, <laughs> talk more, more openly here. Um, and so the, the first thing that I would say is that uh, the conversation about upward mobility, the goal that we have is firmly rooted in this idea of upward mobility and that higher education can be good for the individual, for society, for democracy, all of those things that John King said earlier today that it's imperative that we do these things for the moral reasons, for the economic reasons, for the social reasons. Um, so I see them as intertwined. That said, our goal is not just focused on bachelor's degrees. And I've, I've heard a lot of conversation <laughs> here, and I think some of the research that's undergird some of this has been focused very much singularly on bachelor's degrees, but we have been very specific in saying that we um, want people to get some kind of post-secondary credential as a first credential that's not a dead-end credential that could lead them on a pathway somewhere else. And that's also related to this idea that we're not just talking about traditional students, because we know if we're going to reach the goal that we have to be more expansive in who we're talking about. So while there's a ton of work to do with traditional colleges, traditional students, um, we have to be thinking about what are people uh, learning on the job. I always use the example of, um, oh, I forgot we're live streaming this, so when I use personal examples, I have to be careful, like who's watching. My husband's at home today, so maybe he's watching. So he works at Amazon, right? And there's a lot of people who don't have a post-secondary credential already, but they probably have a lot, well, I know, uh, they have lots of leadership experience. They have lots of understanding of how teams work, lots of understanding of innovation in you know, tough times. And is there not something that they could uh, get credit for in a business program, right? Or a, a program, in under, an undergraduate degree of some sort um, to help them along the way. So, they all actually have uh, programs at Amazon to give people um, post-secondary credentials. But when we think about just thinking outside of our traditional notions of people, someone graduated from high school, they're going to go to college, maybe they don't go uh, right away, maybe they go to community college. And we could talk about community colleges like they're special, but we're not really talking about uh, credit for prior learning, um, on-the-job training and certifications that are intertwined with post-secondary credentials. Those things exist within our system and our ecosystem and they are part of this, but when we think about the, the big goal, we are talking expansively about all of those kinds of things. Um, and so I just put that on the table, acknowledging also that there are serious concerns that we have about uh, what maybe used to be called tracking, um, but just stratification within the system. And we don't want our post-secondary uh, ecosystem, if not a true system, but our ecosystem to become something that just further stratifies people by race, by income, by class. Um, if it's really going to work in the way that we hope it does to create upward mobility, we have to think about, okay, who is getting credentials? Who is getting associate's degrees? Who's getting bachelor's degrees? Um, I hope later we could talk about some of the default rates and being honest about the costs and value into whom we're placing those burdens. Um, so uh, I can't remember your original question, but I think I've said everything I wanted to say. <laughs> Just for this portion. Close enough. Good, yeah. good media training. Yeah. You, 
Uh, you forgot the part about why is the Lumina strategy not working? No. Oh, it's but it's totally, it's totally working. <laughs> it's totally working. And I, well, so I will say these three things. I forgot the three points that I had were that we have to change the incentives at the federal and state level. So you got to do that. I mean, you have to think more expansively. You have to change the incentives. Nancy started to talk about it, and I know we can speak more about some of the things that um, maybe were tried in the Obama administration, and there's still maybe some interest and opportunity to do. Um, this administration or next or whenever. Um, and uh, the second thing being about arming people with, once you change the incent incentives, then state uh, systems and institutions need the tools to kind of carry them out. So uh, Tennessee is a good example of a state that's really moving forward on um, outcomes uh, oriented funding and then thinking about uh, disaggregating those outcomes um, in a way that closes equity gaps, and hopefully Mike can talk a little bit about their work in Tennessee. We need more places other than just Tennessee, Tennessee, Tennessee to, to um, talk about, and obviously that's not the only place where, where good things are happening, but i um, glad that he's here to talk about some of those things. And just the last being really focusing in on the populations that need the most help, and that came up earlier, um, but it's particularly in the past year, uh, we at Lumina have been much more um, just explicit in saying we need to close gaps by race um, within the post-secondary system. And I have found it really important to say by race because um, I work on affordability stuff and almost everybody everywhere is happy to talk about um, gaps by income, which is actually pretty extraordinary. I mean, I think maybe, I don't know, I won't characterize like where in elite circles it's still like, oh, we don't talk about poor people. But actually I found that most people feel like, yes, we should, in America, we should have, you know, paths of upward mobility for people that are, in, that are um, economically distressed or, you know, lower income. But it's very, very uncomfortable, I found, for people to talk explicitly about gaps by race in ways that race is different than income. They are not synonymous, and so there are some things that we can talk about together, but to be very explicit and say, we care about uh, income, yes, and we always have, and want to make sure that those gaps close, but being explicit about talking about gaps by race and talking about that with our partners, people that we fund, states that we work with, et cetera. So, Mike, uh, Tennessee is known, you know, many states and, uh, you know, the prior administration set attainment goals. Uh, Tennessee uh, seems to have not only taken a goal, but to have taken out their pencils and tried to figure out the arithmetic behind how you actually reach that goal. And I wonder if you could talk um, a little bit about um, you know, how you use that goal as a structure for the overall policies and you know, what has changed uh, from you know, perhaps a less purposeful higher education policy in, in years prior. Certainly. And I also have always wondered what it would be like if Twitter were a real place. <laughs> this is my Twitter feed, and so it's really good to be with everyone. If, if the Foo Fighters and CNN walk in, my whole feed will be complete. <laughs> I think what we've been willing to do more than anything is mobilize an attainment goal. To use it as a litmus test for, you know, why are we doing the things we're doing? Why are we building the buildings we're building? Um, one of the things I've learned, I've been in this job about a year, and if you let it, being the state higher education executive officer will only be about building buildings. Being able to pivot away from that and be focused on both upward mobility, but also there's the economic development thing, which is real. I've had the opportunity to be in some pitch meetings recently with potential employers, and this notion, it's not apocryphal. They really do show up with your workforce data already there in a binder. You wouldn't be in the meeting if they didn't already have the data then they're there to question you about what you're going to do to be able to fulfill the obligation of their possible relocation. I think we've also been pretty good at facing our brutal facts. Um, there's no doubt Tennessee's had a good run the last few years in terms of PR around our higher education innovations. Um, we do not believe our own hype. We are still not where we need to be if you look at any measure of higher education attainment and upward mobility. But I think that um, if the first step to fixing the problem is admitting you have one, that attainment goal has been the right vehicle for us to go primarily to non-higher ed audiences and say, this is why having 55% of Tennesseans with a college degree by 2025 matters. This is why the drive to 55 matters. And then being able to use that goal to get towards some systemness. Is it okay to have 13 community colleges, yet we are cooking the cheeseburger 13 different ways? And Tim Rennick is here, I think. And I love when Tim says, what if we are the problem? 
And to be able to go to 13 community colleges and say, we're not gonna have silos of success any longer. We know this works at four community colleges. It's working very well. We're going to disseminate with fidelity. And Dr. Tristan Denley, a Tennessee alumni who's now been traded over to Georgia as a first round draft pick, had a lot to do with sitting in a room and saying, asking why five times, right? And that's the power of having, asking you start with, well, you know, we're not doing great with low income students, why? Well, because they show up and they're dropping out after the first semester, why? And by the fifth why, what you realize is because there's some mechanical part of the higher education admissions industrial complex that is victimizing these students. And the Drive to 55 has been a very powerful tool for us to just have a singular focus across our campuses. I love what somebody said earlier, I think it was Eloy, despite his membership in the 82nd Airborne, he had some incisive comments. Um, when you talk about faculty, you know, higher ed's full of altruists. Nobody got into higher ed, almost everybody got into higher ed because they saw the power of it in their own lives or their family. And so faculty want to be part of something. And Tristan can attest, our Tennessee faculty just kind of continue to rise when we give them a challenge. Okay, we're only doing guided pathways. There are no more undeclared students in Tennessee. There are none. And our faculty said, okay, great, got it. Uh, we're gonna do co-requisite remediation because the old way was really bad. Okay, got it, we'll keep going. Thinking about that next step is, I, I don't think we could be doing it without an attainment goal, which in some ways has been more powerful than the programs. Even Tennessee Promise has been very powerful and I'm happy to talk about it. Tennessee Reconnect, which will make our community colleges tuition free next fall for adults, will be powerful. But I'm not so sure that the attainment goal and the completion culture haven't been the most important things. Mm -hmm. One thing that I am definitely not going to referee is which Army division is tough. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the afternoon session. Yeah, so you guys are going to have to sort that out. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, I think one thing that's interesting about um, your answer, Mike, and Nancy mentioned it too, is the use of data in building a case for change. Um, and of course, you know, University Innovation Alliance, Achieving a Dream are here. Um, you know, I wonder when you think about this new perspective of the upward mobility data um, that we now have on higher education, is that something that is useful to guide systemic efforts to reform? And you know, one thing that is particularly interesting to me about it is that you know, we as a field have been very focused on completion. You know, completion is not in the equation of the upward mobility. They are focused on employment outcomes you take employment outcomes to a campus, people often say, well, that's not, you know, that's reductionist, uh, that is largely out of our control. So, um, you know, is this, um, is this information on employment outcomes something that will change the way we think about how we guide colleges and universities to improve? So, I, I think know. having um, a metric is very powerful, and I think that's what you're saying, Mike about the attainment agenda. Yes. Uh, and it's been difficult to have a metric on employability. It, it's kind of been all over the place and we have to, I think in all of our efforts to improve, we've got to accept the metrics available to us. So if we're worried about 40% of the kids in high, in low income school districts coming to kindergarten unprepared for kindergarten, which sounds more outrageous than coming to college unprepared for college, but almost half of the underserved population in America comes to kindergarten underprepared, and the only reason we can say that is because we have a metric. We, they're not agreed upon. There must be many. Uh, Zakia, you may know more of them than I do, but even if you're using the one that your community or your state prefers, you have a measure. We have a lot of controversy about testing for literacy and reading in the third grade, but frankly, if we don't have a metric, if we're not measuring it, even if it only suits our community, how are we ever gonna know how many, how few people can read in the third grade? Why do we think they're gonna read in the eighth grade? If we don't have a metric for calculation expertise in the, in the middle school, how are we gonna, so long story short, at every step of the way, we as an education community 
kind of owe it to ourselves and all the people we serve to, cre to create a measurable metric that we can zero in on and be public about success or failure. And to me, the end game of employability or employee uh, success or salary, if we could just sort of get there to, to use it and use it systematically, I think we could see more hope for the Lumina agenda. And I just want to say, if you live in a, a community that's looking at educating children and youth, literally from birth to career, and you've agreed on seven metrics, not perfect, and maybe hopefully someday a measure of social and emotional health, and you put all that together, trust me, you'll know whether you are serving children in America. And that, to me, is what this fine research team has provided for us. Uh, can I say that I keep thinking about the end user of an attainment goal, right? For us, it's a Tennessean. And convincing them that they do need to go to college, when you think about metrics, the only metric, the most important metric for us has been an earnings discussion. Mm -hmm. And rather than take on the what do you make by major, we just took on the very clear binary variable about didn't go to college and went to college. And if you haven't done that in your state, if your state's capable, I would strongly encourage you to go grab a high school class cohort, see what happened to the ones that didn't go to college. Because in Tennessee, they're making $10,000 a year. And real-time data, which has enabled us to go back to the end user, Tennessee communities, and there is always one person in every Rotary Club that's ready to say, not everybody needs to go to college. Mm -hmm. um, right. A couple things I've found, they normally want somebody else's kids not to go to college. Exactly. Their kids are going. Their kids mm -hmm. are But going. they've decided somebody else's kids aren't going to college. When you hit them with the $10,000 statistic, what it shatters is this belief that the high school diploma is still a credential that translates in the workplace. And then the second thing it unearths, hearkening back to the earlier discussion, is that college may mean a bunch of different things and that our, 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 I think our reflexive, almost all of us are probably products of a four-year degree, and so I think it's reflexive for us to go to four-year degrees. But if you view yourselves as kind of in the emergency room of higher ed, which we do in our state, there are many students coming in where a technical college or community college path will be completely transformational. But you can't tell them that unless you're able to talk about things like $10,000 a year. So I think what's really helpful is to, and we started out this morning talking a little bit about data, and I think that this is a data conversation, it's a transparency conversation, and it's an accountability conversation, mm -hmm. all kind of wrapped into one. And so from a data point of view, I think that what this research says is that even in the absence of a uniform student record uh, um, system, smart researchers can get data from different sources and put it together in a way that will allow us to have a kind of longitudinal view mm -hmm. of, uh, of student success. And I think it's a great advance, and I think it's really, it's really important. And we should build on that using other data sets, looking more uh, comprehensively across states that are doing a, a, a good job of, of collecting data. From a transparency point of view, I think step one for the end user in Tennessee is this binary go, don't go. Step two, I think, needs to be, yeah. all right, what do improved okay. data tell us about choices that people can make and about, uh, um, Yuri was talking about the, still the grotesque uh, variance in outcomes by race uh, across different programs. Data, as the data improves, that kind of transparency will be there and hopefully it will impel action, action by institution leaders, action by systems leaders. And then the last piece, I think, is the, is the accountability piece, is that I think the flip side of transparency about choices and decision making is um, public accountability at an institutional level, uh, which I think this, uh, these data have been um, so, so compelling in uh, focusing, focusing the attention of institutional leaders on uh, where they have been, David Leonhardt's work as well. Uh, just on, on where they where they are, like it or not, institutions want to show well against socially responsible metrics. In some cases, socially irresponsible metrics, but that's just U.S. news. Um, there are bunches of gro growing numbers of socially responsible metrics that I think are uh, compelling for for institutional leaders, and hopefully will lead to a, a kind of 
um, good practice sharing that we really haven't seen outside of the established systems and networks like the um, uh, Achieving the Dream and University Innovation Innovation Alliance. Can I so, say something about the, the employment outcomes data? Yeah, but I want to follow with Ted. Sure. And then, yeah. um, so, you know, I mean, I've been in Washington just long enough to see this pendulum swing between innovation and quality assurance. It seems to happen about every eight years for some reason. Um, uh, you know, is there uh, some way to think about um, better insight into whether students are reaching their goals as a way of trying to get out of, um, you know, this uh, constant um, uh, uh, desire to promote innovation followed by, um, you know, a flood of bad actors and then tightening up the clamps again. Yeah. Um, so I want to, can I, I'll start a step back. I think that innovation is not just a fad or something that we do because we want to do things differently. I think you know, Michael's exactly right. We have the system we designed uh, f for whatever reasons and, and redesign may be a better word than, than innovation because innovation gets colored with lots of, lots of stuff. But you know, if we want to serve the, the new normal student who is our future, then we simply can't accept our own narratives about what college looks like. We have to really go back to the beginning and talk about time, place, and manner in ways that we are starting to do, and that's very exciting. If you, if you sort of say we've got to do that, then your question about the pendulum becomes a different question, I think. It's what kinds of responsible guardrails can we put up around redesign that is directly uh, aimed at um, bridging gaps by socioeconomic uh, origin, by uh, academic preparation, and you know, critically by, by race. And if we can do that, I think we, we're, we're better off. The key to those guardrails, I think, is, and many of you get really tired of hearing me say this, is about being clearer and crisper about measuring outcomes and, and having those outcome measurements really be the determining factors of whether students have been well served. Uh, so earlier, I think it was um, Margaret Spellings who talked about the way we talk to people. And one of the things that I've really appreciated more, I would say, in the past year is the need for us in the policy and uh, leadership community to be clearer about what our solutions would do for individuals when we talk about the system. So people are frustrated that they know that they have to go to college because they, they know, they kind of get it, they're frustrated because they feel like they don't want to have to go because frankly, you know, 50 years ago, white men didn't have to go to college to earn a middle class degree and now they do. And so you're seeing that same demographic be frustrated by that fact. Um, and so they're frustrated. It costs a lot more than it did previously. And so many people still want to attain that credential, but realize that it's, it's, they're not necessarily being priced out because we're finding ways to offer them more and more loans, but uh, we're telling them that they have to take loans. And when I hearken back to when I first started out in this kind of stuff, I was uh, wanting to be a teacher and I did um, student teaching, but I also worked at a gear up program where I was directly counseling you know, low income high school students, and it was really, really frustrating because I was having this conversation without really any data. We didn't have the college scorecard or whatever, and, and so I'd be like, you are gonna earn so much more money, and I would show them these national aggregated data about people earning more money over the course of their lifetime. And they're like, okay, so UMass Boston, or like the Culinary Institute, or you know, like, uh, you know, whatever's on the green line versus me having to transfer to the red line. I mean, obviously we know that students' choices are much more constrained to their their geography, but I guess my point was the um, conversation that I was having them with them was really frustrating because their lives are not on average. Their lives were in a very specific place and they were very specific people and we didn't have any kind of, I mean, just even state by state, by state data would be That's better. Right. But, um, you know, institutional data and eventually program level data. And I, I think it does make people uncomfortable when you start to get very specific. Um, but, and this was just transparency. This is just, you're trying to make a decision and I think this is a point that we don't appreciate as much. Like when you're just talking to people, you're for the most part asking them to borrow money. You don't borrow money uncollateralized and think you're gonna, unless there's a, there's a return that you're going to get. So I just, I just find it fascinating that we're kind of are tiptoeing around employment outcomes about college as if we are not asking people to borrow money to go. I, it just blows my mind. It'd be one thing if it was like completely free and there was no investment involved, but literally, we want people to be financially literate. Finance 101 is, you know, when you borrow money, you understand how you're going to pay it back. 
And so if, you're, when, if you want people to be more understanding of how they're taking on loans, et cetera, you have to give them data about you know, what their likely earnings are. And, and you obviously contextualize it. You make sure people know this is not a guarantee. This is not a job guarantee. You know, your, your whatever may differ. But to say in aggregate, most people will earn more going to college, you know, so therefore, so it's like, so should I take out this loan? Uh, should I take out this private student loan on top of that? Mm -hmm. And I think um, just in closing on this one particular point, last year I also read, uh, or maybe it was earlier this year, Tressie McMillan Cotton's book, Lower Ed. And when you talk to students and you understand the psychology, if these are students who have bought in to the totally. American dream of college, t completely, totally. totally, they're already there. They're like, yes, you told me I need to go to college, I'm going to college. This place you know, made it very easy for me to sign up, I'm in college, I am doing college because you told me to do college. And when I looked at the data last week from the National Center on Education yeah. Statistics, it said the, that the, well, so now I'm going to average, but the average African American student 12 years after borrowing owes more on their student loan than they did when they took it out. After 12 years of payments that nearly half are in default, and default is a really, really bad measure. I mean, that's not like 30 days late, 60 days late, 90 days late, which is the measurements that we were using for the mortgage crisis, like how far, day, how many days late. Default is you have not paid anything in nine months and they will garnish your wages. I mean, this is a really, really bad, your credit is forever screwed. Nearly half? That is outrageous. It was over 20% of bachelor's degree graduates I mean, it shattered the talking point that I've been using that this is only a problem among people who don't complete. It's certainly worse among people who complete. It was like 75% of for-profit uh, student dropouts. I mean, that is devastating. And so for us to say, well, we don't even think it's appropriate to talk about program level data, to share it as transparency, I mean, my God, that data made me think, we need to stop giving out loans if you can't show that you're, <laughs> which is, you know, the, that would be the next level of you know, seriousness about this conversation. So I just can't impress enough how um, we have to move beyond our discomfort in thinking about employment outcomes in higher education uh, in a very specific way for students. So I wanna uh, talk a little bit about how we try and think about translating research into change on campuses. And um, you know, we've talked a lot about uh, data, which is certainly important. Um, you know, I think the traditional policy making strategy would be, you know, you would define the problem, you would go read a bunch of research, look at model programs, hopefully one of them had been rigorously evaluated, and then you would try and fund that so that everyone would do that. Uh, in the Obama administration, we thought we had like a little bit of a smarter approach, which was the investing in innovation. We we're like, we're, we're just going to let the research guide us and we will uh, try and build the evidence base, and once something does have a strong evidence base, we will try and scale that up. In higher education, the theory that seems to reign right now is pay pay performance-based funding, um, which is very popular in states. Uh, it's, you know, a lot of educators seem to sort of draw back and express concerns about um, uh, credential inflation and uh, the impact on disadvantaged students. Um, on the other hand, you also hear, um, you know, President Fenves, others say, you know, UT Austin is now graduating, uh, is now enrolling more students because they have more students graduating on time, and yet they take a hit in their funding from the state for achieving that desirable outcome. So, you know, I wonder, uh, you know, sorting through these questions, transparency, uh, new programs, following the research, paying for outcomes, what is the right way that we can create a policy environment for colleges that want to be a more reliable route to middle class? Is it performance funding? Is it one of these other tools? It's a component. I mean, I think we're seven years into outcomes-based funding in Tennessee. We recognize it has been an important tool. It is not the only tool. Um, I do often say, so if not performance-based funding, then what? And that typically is an enrollment-based model, and colleges get really good at enrolling students and not succeeding them. Um, I think the other thing about the outcomes-based funding formula, if you, in Tennessee at least, we incent low-income student success and adult student success. And that's important to us to make sure that you are not having, uh, rather we, we and have beginning to see seven years in, as you would imagine, it's a, a, a big ship to turn, but we're beginning to see the traces of data 
among underserved students beginning to peak up because colleges are getting paid more per student that graduates versus the old way, which was whoever showed up on the 14th day you got paid for. So I think I always go into that question with, it, what else, what, how else would we fund colleges? Um, I can't imagine having a funding structure that's incongruent with an attainment agenda. And our funding structure has managed to run in parallel with it. It's not perfect, but I think that it has at least set the foundation for us to be able to push forward versus enrollment-based funding, which sets the foundation for admissions operations. I think this is an area where some cross-sector collaboration would really be helpful. Um, oddly enough, in healthcare reform, which is still so controversial, New York is deep into Medicaid redesign, looking at patient wellness as opposed to patient served, and so that, what is it, meds in beds and heads in seats or whatever the analog <laughs> is, we haven't made that shift, interestingly enough. And so when you look at the Medicaid reform, in my view, done right, and you look at value-based payments, that's an amazing transformation, and, and they're doing it. Even though we think healthcare is in crisis, there are parts of it that would make so much sense for us, and it even gets more exciting when value-based payments are shared between early childhood educators and pediatricians, where we begin to look across sectors. So, A, anything would be better than a plug number that goes up and down in your state, because it's just a number, but it's been there forever, and there are states where post-secondary funding is done that way. Anything would be better than enrollment-driven, because that only speaks to a part of the access agenda. But when you get to uh, the end game and success in career, this changing the value base I think would, would help us a lot. And we do so much in the aggregate. We talk about our success as if the only measure is thousands and millions of students. And I think if we were a little bit more focused as a campus or a system on the most challenged populations, largely in our cities and rural areas, which is going to be very, very diverse, not only by income, but by race, by ethnicity, and we actually adopted a cohort. One of the challenges I think we have in performance-based funding or outcomes-based funding is that our faculty, our program directors, by and large, don't know how to use data to improve programs. They either don't know how or they are not incentivized to use the data. And so what we see in lower education is that people are really doing what hospitals have been doing for a long, long time, which is controlling quality by dissecting the problem into a data set that they can contribute to. And when you think about it, we are not training, usually a controversial term, the minions who, who work in our facilities to use the data that might be generated by this movement toward performance education to actually track student progress mm -hmm. and then fix it when it's broken. Mm -hmm. Because it's not a skill set that we think we need. That's I, a long way from performance, but look at the medical profession hard. Yeah, so I, I think that's right. I think the last point is a particularly important one. I'll come back to it. I think, James, the, the arc that we're seeing develop in higher ed. And, and I think that we need to support the even more robust development of a higher education research community that draws from a variety of different disciplines. Um, I think that the mobility uh, work and the papers that were uh, gathered to talk about today are, are a great example of um, a, a kind of basic social science research that creates insights that we haven't had about individual institutions in the sector as a whole. And I think the more of that we have, the better. The second phase of it, I think, is then um, institutions who either on their own or urged by performance funding or other mechanisms, institutions saying, okay, well, let's see what we can do about this. So the second level has to be a level of efficacy uh, research or evaluation that you, know, you, were, you were talking about in the, in the K-12 K -12 context. 
And then the hardest part, I think, for our sector is even on the basis of here's a problem, here are some evidence-based solutions, is then the dissemination of those, of those practices. It's why the networks are so, are so important. The, one of the strengths of American higher ed is the diversity of institutional type and form and, and individualized governance. That makes it really difficult to spread, uh, to spread innovation. I think it's why uh, groups like this need to uh, continue to do this. And while I'm on the topic, I hope that um, at the next CLIMB conference, we look out and see a more diverse population of, of researchers and, and practitioners. I think that that's an important way for us to build capacity in the field uh, to embed, the, embed this work. Um, but we haven't been good at that, and I think it's a key problem that we, that we, need, to, that we need to try to solve. Zakia, do you think about uh, this in the perspective of federal policy, where our biggest, you know, our biggest investments by far are Pell Grants and the college tax credit, some fifty billion a year, which flow to students and through them to institutions on the basis of enrollment? Is there something that the federal government should be doing differently to support institutions that are investing in quality? Yeah. Yes. Um, I think we talked a lot and tried a couple of times at various points in the Obama administration to um, muse about what a, a system that was more focused on outcomes of e any kinds of outcomes that were not just access. So everything, we have a system oriented to access and we got more access, so that was good. And so now we have kind of a challenge with completion and actually people getting credentials and how do we move to a, to a way, to a system that acknowledges that, but not just the credentials because um, then, yeah, you will just get a lot of, of credentials. How do you make sure that those are backed and that there's a quality uh, backstop there? Um, and interestingly, I mean, going prior to the Obama administration, there were definitely other um, initiatives. Uh, Secretary Spelling talked about some, you know, kind of ways to think more robustly about quality. The Spellings Commission really led the way in, in that. And I would even harken back to, um, if anyone is a, I'm a history nerd, so I really like, we did these history financial aid films that you <laughs> helped us with. So even going back on the accountability and, and quality and completion, um, John Boehner, when he was chairman of the uh, Education and Workforce Committee, had like a proposal to change campus-based aid to be more mm -hmm. focused on, you know, outcomes, <laughs> things that we care about. So I mean, there's a, there should be a bipartisan interest in moving what levers you, you could. And I think you need to be creative in thinking about how that could happen. Because as you know, our aid goes to students I would, I think from this, again, from the student perspective, like if you picked a random person and said, do you feel like this goes to you? It doesn't actually go to students directly. It's funneled through institutions and you can't access, it's not a true voucher. It's not like somebody sends you a check to your house and then you decide like where you wanna go with that. Um, I, I'm fascinated by the, the way we talk about vouchers here versus the way they happen in, in the conversation about vouchers in K-12 um, and just even the kind of economic theory of how vouchers should work even if you were a purist and thinking that vouchers would drive like quality, the way we administer our vouchers is not in any way designed to drive that. So let's just kind of maybe think about the fact that even though they are vouchers, essentially they are funneled through colleges, so we're giving money to colleges. And um, colleges depend on the money that we are giving for access. And so just blowing this up, if you move to a outcomes-oriented system, obviously there are a lot of indicators, but you would want some kind of quality-driven outcomes as well. Um, and I think having that conversation is, we're overdue, uh, and it should definitely happen at the federal level. I won't go so far to, to say as what beyond, like post-graduate outcomes there should be, uh, but I think there's a, definitely an appetite. There has been historically an appetite in a bipartisan way to have that conversation, and, I, and not just Pell Grants and, and tax credits, to your point about the federal expenditure. This is a tougher one, but I do think we have to have that conversation about loans. We have a, a challenge with our loans because we make money on them. So no one ever wants to really fiddle with them <laughs> because um, you fiddle with them and you give them to fewer people and you make less money. And so, um, but if we think it's important to have accountability for Pell Grants from a student or institutional perspective, it's the same kind of things so that we should do it kind of with the totality of our aid. Great. So we have a couple minutes left and uh, there are a couple of microphones in the room. So I thought we might take a couple of quick questions or comments and then uh, give everyone a, a, a chance for a, a closing statement or parting thought as Jerry Springer used to do. Mm. <laughs> Steve Bird is roaming and I can't tell if he's trying to find a microphone. <laughs> uh, 
Hi, um, I'm Steve Bird. I'm with New America. I really appreciated that uh, Mike uh, Krauss um, mentioned the um, uh, the admission. What did you say? The higher ed admissions the industrial higher education complex. Higher education admissions industrial complex. I wish there was the a little self licking bit, ice cream cone. Yeah, I wish there was a little more discussion about that uh, in this room. Um, and looking at these uh, issues of access and socioeconomic diversity and stuff. Um, Nancy, when you were uh, at SUNY, there was a large increase in uh, foreign student recruiting, international student recruiting. SUNY has been a leader in that. I just wonder if that is also leading to fewer low-income students getting seats at these schools. We have room to grow. And I think we've not been as creative about diverse populations being recruited into our community colleges. A number of them um, have lower enrollments than they would desire. I think most threatened in the SUNY system, even beyond the community colleges, is the comprehensives who are not seeing their role in the modern world of online education, et cetera. So frankly, I think we probably all have some degree of room, but I think in systems you have more flexibility to channel the spaces you have. So I, I really didn't, I don't see that as a problem. I see it as a need to use more of our seats more effectively. Yeah, Amy. Or do both, um, which is, has been our approach. I'll just say this um, without this turning into Mike, a- Mike, I'm sorry, let me just say, for if anyone didn't hear the question, oh, yes, it, please. it was, uh, is free college the right way to spend scarce resources and is there a trade-off with investments in quality? Yeah, definitely. I, I, without this panel being a referendum on the discussion around free college, I would just say what it really accomplishes is it hones the message about going to college. And rather than the previous structure which was designed by the fluent for the fluent, it boils down the message to a very clear common denominator. It has been, in Tennessee, it has been explosive. Our college going rate went up 5% in 12 months, which is the largest that we can detect in any state, perhaps ever. Uh, and we became number one in the nation for FAFSA. I think those are some undeniable outcomes. I would quickly pivot to say what happens next is what matters. And these students becoming completers um, we're working closely with Complete College America to think through all of every piece of our pipeline to make sure that that Tennessee promise truly becomes, I think, that what we've been discussing here around an employment outcome. But I would also argue that the performance-based funding in some ways allowed us to do Tennessee promise. Because whenever you open up those floodgates, uh, there were a lot of questions that arose around, man, how are we going to handle this? How are we going to know colleges are still operating you know, very definitively around certain waypoints? Well, the answer for us was our formula. Our formula, more than anything, tells an incredibly detailed story about what's happening on our campuses. We were able to do both. Not every state can. But if anybody takes anything away from the free college discussion, I would just say, it's not right for every state. It's been transformative in ours. And I think the, the free message really does cut across. We didn't talk a ton in detail about affordability, but the, one of the things that I've been frustrated by is that when we policy analysts and people in higher ed talk about affordability, we talk about financial aid, right. we talk about it, disc and we talk about simplifying financial aid, we talk about simplifying the process. Um, what, that is not the same as telling somebody what you will pay, and I would argue that there are very transparent payment systems that we could maybe take some lessons from in other sectors. But even if you tell somebody that they have a $2,000 grant and you tell them that very early and you're very, that would be a better system than we have now. If you still have this huge variable out there that is tuition and fees and other stuff that is growing and that is unknown and you're not talking about these things in a joint, a joint way, you've missed the boat. And so it's another way that like we in this community kind of are missing I kind of think of it as the conversation that you avoid having at holidays with your family when you try to explain to them what you do. Um, try to have that conversation because I think it actually makes our work clearer. Like if I can't actually, if I'm supposed to be talking about college affordability, I'm supposed to be making it better for students. And when I go to see my family and it's the cousin who's been trying to go back and they can't figure it out and I can't talk about the solutions that we're um, developing in a way that resonates with them, then I've failed. And so I would just, 
urge us all to kind of think more about are we really getting to something that cuts across the people and you cannot deny that free does. And so what I always say is if you don't like free, well, what's the alternative? Because that is taking off in states where it maybe should be and where it shouldn't be um, in ways that are thoughtful like maybe Tennessee did it and maybe not so thoughtful. And so right now I think we're in a, we have a dearth of alternatives that are just as clear cut in terms of messaging to individuals, but I think there's room to kind of talk about that and say what would that look like. And I also think there's room for people in this room to be very active with policymakers in developing and informing them on what the best kind of approach would be um, to be clearer, whether it's free or something else. So we are out of time, but before we wrap up, I just wanted to invite Ted or Nancy if they had any, uh, they wanted to weigh in on that question or had another parting thought. So I want to go back to the last um, panel and just and also the, the group that's, that's assembled. I think, and we talked about this a little bit yesterday, uh, whether it's at the state level, the federal level, system level, or institution level, leadership really does matter. Uh, and one of the things that I think we all need to commit ourselves to is to helping give leaders at whatever level uh, the sort of support that they need to be able to make the deliberate choices to have the political will to do the redesign, uh, to get on with the work that um, calls us here today. But I think leadership does matter. That's why AC develops its uh, work so hard on leadership ca capacity building. But that's not something that any of us can do alone. We all have to do it together. So um, I keep thinking that uh, part of the problem is that we don't really have a system of public education in America, and I don't mean public versus private. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have not ingested the notion that learning begins very, very early. Some would say the first thousand days of a child's life is 80% of the shot. Mm. And we are the only industry I can think of that considers our task as beginning at grade 13. So I just want to say to the few people who have alluded to the fact that we are really not partnering up at the start of the game, we're getting in at the middle and we're looking at the end. We will not get to the end if we don't embrace a system of education that literally begins at birth. Uh, Elroy did this in Long Beach, and it was incredibly appropriate. And what did it get you? System head, be careful. But we don't have that system. We are not talking to leaders in the P-12 sector authentically. And I just feel like this could be the impetus not only for learning more about what we can and cannot do from grade 13 on, but consider that 40% of the grade 13 problems started somewhere else, which is our problem too. I've heard it said, but I don't think our actions are gonna get us there unless we think about the end game at the beginning. All right, so good news, we've made it to lunch. Uh, please join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs>